my very great pleasure to welcome all of you to the Living Room Lecture Series at Locust Grove, or with Locust Grove. Some of us are at Locust Grove, some of us are not, um, but we're so grateful for the opportunity to gather together with you today um, and with Lori Stahlgren to talk about um, the archaeology of the enslaved of Jefferson County. Um, we are going to put it over to our executive director, Carol Ely, in just a minute. I do wanna make just a few quick announcements. Um, we are going to ask everyone to keep their microphones turned off. Um, you can keep your video camera on, just please keep your microphone um, turned off. Um, and if you want to only see Lori's face in the upper right-hand corner of your Zoom window, there is something that says speaker view. Switch it to speaker view, and that way you will only see the person who is speaking. Um, you will um, will also be sharing a PowerPoint with Lori. Uh, so, and we are making a recording of this program. So, if you miss any part of it, uh, we will be sending that out within the next week or so. Um, but without, oh, one more thing. Also, you will ask questions in the chat. Lori is already saying hello to her mother and father who have joined us today. So it's always great to, <laughs> it's always great to say hello to our parents. Uh, and we're glad to have all of you, including the extended Stahlgren family with us today. Um, but now take it away, Carol. Hey, hi, I was just, flipping through the images to see who's here. You know, Wednesday's lecture day was always really exciting to get to see the people that we um, see the names of on documents and checks. And, uh, you know, we talked to you on the phone, but we're still virtual, but it's, it's good to see you here. And um, we have some good news, I think, to share. We are finally starting construction on the pavilion, the capital project that we've been talking about for so long and raising money for for so long. Uh, we hope to be starting in about a month. The contract has been signed with Woodbine Construction and uh, we hope it will be done in about eight months, which puts us in the middle of next summer. We'll have some great new facilities where we can do socially distanced outdoor programs. You know, who knew? When we started this uh, adventure back in 2011 is when we started planning this, that uh, we would need a space for socially distanced outdoor programs, but we'll have it. And uh, so it's great to finally get that going after all this time. And we are continuing with uh, programs as we can virtually. Um, Hannah will tell you a little bit more about some upcoming things. We're even going to have our annual meeting, but it will be online. And, uh, but if you do have the urge to have something real happen in your life, please come and enjoy the grounds. It is amazingly beautiful here right now, especially now that the weather has turned, well, today is warm, but it's turned towards fall and the fall flowers are out. The meadow is in its um, last stages of flowering and setting seed. And uh, you have 55 acres to be socially distanced. So I hope you get a chance to enjoy it. And uh, over the last couple months, uh, we've been making a lot of progress on our programs about the enslaved. We are working on transforming what was once the wood shop into a recreation of the dwelling of an enslaved family. We've been doing a lot on social media and uh, continuing with the research, which has been very exciting. And it's great that we have Lori here with us because the research on the enslaved at Locust Grove really started with the archeology. span with um, digs back in the, I guess, 80s and 90s, Lori will tell us more, but uh, that started to turn up actual physical evidence of the way people live their lives here. And that uh, is the basis for the research that we've started to confirm with documents and public, um, public sources and letters. And uh, it's great to be reminded again that we do have this amazing collection of artifacts from Locust Grove that people like Lori can help us interpret. So I'm really excited to have Lori here with us. So I'm, I'm done, move on. Let's get to Lori. <laughs> I think I think we are all we're all so excited to have Lori with us today. Um, just a couple things to piggyback very quickly off of uh, what Carol just said. Um, Locust Grove is all in on virtual events right now um, because having people in um, any of our spaces is challenging. So we are going to be having. Um, 
another lecture this month. Um, it's going to be with Cynthia Meharry of the African American Genealogy Group of Kentucky, and she's going to be talking to us about um, finding your family or finding family members or how to find descendants of enslaved people using public records. And that lecture will be on October 21st. If you are on Locust Grove's email mailing list, I will put a link to sign up for that in the chat. You will get your link to buy tickets to that event on Friday. Um, but the event is um, October 21st at 1 p.m., just like all of our lectures. And that same weekend, the 24th and 25th of October, we will be hosting a virtual market fair. Um, market fair is, of course, one of our most popular events here at Locust Grove. We didn't want a year um, to pass by without um, having it join us. Um, in some way, having our reenactors join us in some form or fashion. So please stay tuned for our virtual market fair programs. And also coming up in November, on November 4th, um, James Pritchard of the Filson will be uh, speaking to us about the Harp Brothers, the first serial killers in America. So stay tuned for some blood curdling stuff that happens right after Halloween. Um, you know, you thought you were scared and then we're gonna get you real real scared. Um, but without further ado, Lori, are you ready to be introduced? Okay. You're, Lori's going to unmute herself and I'm going to read her introduction. Lori is a staff archaeologist at the Kentucky Archaeological Survey and is assistant director of the Riverside Archaeology Program. She's a native of Virginia but has lived in Louisville most of her life and graduated from Assumption High School. So did I. That's great. Um, she has a BA in photojournalism from Western Kentucky University, a law degree from the University of Louisville, an MA in anthropology from Northern Arizona University, and is a PhD candidate in anthropology at Syracuse University. Lori specializes in historical archaeology and is particularly interested in the archaeology of plantations and slavery. She has worked um, at many archaeological sites in the area and she is the archaeologist for Farmington Historic Home. She's also interested in historic preservation issues and serves on the Louisville Historical League Board of Directors and assists Metro Louisville. Previously, she worked at the Jefferson County Office of Historic Preservation and Archives and for the Kentucky Heritage Council and she is a project archaeologist with the Kentucky Archaeology Survey and is on the staff of the folk studies and anthropology departments at Western Kentucky University. Uh, Lori, who's already had a strong interest in historic preservation, became interested in archaeology after she volunteered to wash artifacts during a Kentucky Archaeological Survey program. And what a better way to get started than washing artifacts. So Lori, take it away. All right. Well, like, like um, Hannah said, I'm Lori, and I work for the Kentucky Archaeological Survey. And um, the survey is based out of Western Kentucky University, and we do archaeology for local governments, um, small places in Kentucky that can't afford to do, um, hire big firms to do archaeology. And we do a lot of educational archaeology. We also do all the big stuff that other firms might do, but we don't have a huge staff. So um, we mostly do educational things um, like the program at um, Riverside, which is COVID um, stopped right now. Um, but we would have almost 3,000 kids come out every um, fall and spring to um, go through the house and, and do some archaeology and learn a little bit about history. Now, I've done some public archaeology at Locust Grove, too. We had a summer camp. Um, and we do public archaeology all over the place. So I love talking to people, the public, about archaeology and what we know and how we know it. So that's what we're going to do today. Um, today, I'm going to be talking specifically about artifacts from three local plantations. Um, it's Locust Grove, Farmington, and Riverside. So first of all, a plantation. A lot of people think that we never had plantations in Kentucky because we're not in Georgia like Tara and we don't have 12 Oaks and, and that sort of thing. Um, it really doesn't matter um, if you had enslaved people producing the um, kind of cash crop, it was a plantation. Um, yes, our plantations were a little different than what you saw in Gone with the Wind but that didn't make them any less plantations. Um, 
we also know a ton about um, Kentucky's wealthy white landowners, right? We um, know their names and faces and we have records from them, but we don't know a lot, of, a lot about the people who did all the work on their plantations, right? Um, my job is to change that so that we learn things about the people who aren't in the history books. And to do our jobs as archaeologists, we study artifacts. We're going to talk about over 30,000 artifacts <laughs> today, <laughs> not each one. <laughs> um, artifacts are anything made or used by people. So anything that a human made or modified, that's what we study. We also study artifact disposal patterns. You think, what is a disposal pattern? It's actually the context. It is where the artifact is found, what it's found with, and then we make um, inferences from that um, to kind of get clues about, about what those artifacts can mean. Okay, we also study as a historical archaeologist. Um, I get the question a lot that why do we need archaeology about stuff that's already written about? Because we have all these documents, right? We have tax records and marriage records and birth records and death records. And, but um, in all honesty, we, the people who are in charge write the, um, write the history books and keep all the records. The enslaved people at Locust Grove, at Farmington, and at Riverside didn't have a great chance to put any, anything in the books. There occasionally, and we'll talk about a few of them, um, but this gives a picture into their lives, how they actually lived a day-to-day -day life in 19th century Kentucky, okay? Um, let's see. All right, we can um, move to the next slide. Maybe. <laughs> oh, let's try this again. Now? I don't see it moving. Okay, let me stop the share and try again. Bear with us, everyone. It worked perfectly earlier. <laughs> it did, it did. All right. Is Indiana Jones up now? Indiana Jones is up. Okay, fantastic. <laughs> um, I don't have a whip, but I do have the hat. <laughs> um, we almost never get chased by Nazis. And I, I, like I said, I don't have the whip and I don't steal artifacts from indigenous peoples, but I do have a lot of fun. Um, although, after, if you come dig with me um, at one of our public programs, a lot of people are like, wow, this is a lot more tedious than I thought. Um, archaeology takes a long time. It's very um, meticulous. And um, if you think about it like doing a puzzle, you're doing a puzzle where you don't have all the pieces, maybe about a quarter of the pieces, and you don't have the picture to work from. That's what archaeology is. Okay. All right. We can go off Indy, even though I really like him and he's a lot better looking than me. <laughs> All right. We, we do archaeology to study history. Um, more specifically, like I said, what is not in the history books. And we can flip again. Um, history is made in the present. Okay. It is, it is, um, what we study, how we study, and how we write about it is all done in, and influenced by the present. Um, luckily for archaeologists, we have solid things that we work with, the artifacts. We can't change the artifacts and we can't make anything up, but we can only interpret them, and that's what we're doing, okay? All right, we can move on. Our, for our discussion today, the broadest context is the Kentucky borderland, which consists of the areas and communities located along the Ohio River between Kentucky and Indiana. It's a physical boundary between a slave state and a northern free state. Um, in the early 19th century, the city of Louisville sat on the very edge of slavery and freedom, 
of agrarianism and urban industrialism. Louisville is difficult to characterize. It is not fully Southern or Northern, and it's a home to a large number of immigrants um, and has many racial and class issues. It's an industrial city prim in a primarily agricultural state. And all these characteristics shaped Louisville's history and even its current racial um, difficulties and how enslaved people lived in this area. Next, our more specific contexts include Farmington, Locust Grove, and Riverside. <laughs> I have personally worked at all three places and we'll give you a little bit of introduction to each of them before I start talking about all the artifacts. So this is the Farmington main house. Farmington Plantation was a 550 acre hemp plantation, first settled by Judge John Speed and his second wife, Lucy Fry Speed, in the very first part of the 19th century. Next. And there they are. Next. By 1840, at John Speed's death, 57 enslaved African Americans lived and worked at Farmington. And you can see here, this is a copy of the inventory um, made at John Speed's death. They listed everything he owned as they um, processed his estate. Next, the main cash crop was hemp, and a very important in industry in Kentucky and um, both for slavery and in the Deep South. Um, Kentucky hemp was not made for like shipping rope or anything, but more for baling cotton. So the more cotton the Deep South made, the more hemp bags they needed. So it was perpetuated um, throughout the very early 19th century. Next. So everyone always asks me, were so-and-so good to their slaves? Um, the most honest answer is, is no. The enslaved were property to them. Um, it doesn't matter how nice anyone was to them. Um, they were sold and used as chattel. They were not seen, they were seen as investments, not humans. And this is a um, reward posted by John Speed for Fraser, who ran away from Farmington. Um, yeah. Next. In the 1990s, the University of Louisville conducted excavations at Farmington and uncovered a, the foundation of a cabin um, right off the main complex of outbuildings that were still standing. And here you can see the hearth pad of the fireplace of the cabin. It's that kind of big square. Next. And this is a drawing of the, of the cabin. Um, on the right side, you can see what's called a robber's trench. That actually didn't have any rock there. Somebody had, um, in the 19th century, dug it up and used it probably in another building. Okay. All right, next. This is a painting done of Farmington in 1820 by a man named Rutherford who was visiting Farmington and um, so it's a lot different picture than what you, um, when you drive up now, it looks very different. Um, but you can see in the left side, a little cabin. And if you flip to the next slide, you can see it a little more close up. So that we think that's our cabin that we dug up in, in, the, in the 90s. Now, if you flip to the next slide, this is a different picture of the cabin done from the archaeology evidence. This is in a video that the Kentucky Archaeological Survey produced in, gosh, I, I, don't, I forget when, it was probably like 2007 or 8. Um, Hannah will put up a link for that video, which you can watch, and it's occasionally on um, um, KET. Um, it's Kentucky, beneath Kentucky's fields and streets. Um, but this is the cabin based on the archaeology. Um, we, you didn't see the porch in that picture or that painting, but that was in 1820. 
Um, the building stood probably until 1880 or 1890, so the porch may have been added later. Um, we found post holes where the, the um, supports for the porch were, and underneath the one end, we found a big pit of ash where they probably emptied out the fireplace every day. All right, next. The next place is Locust Grove. Um, and it was settled a little earlier than Farmington and it's the home of Willie, William and Lucy Clark Cron. And it was established about 1790. And by 1819, um, the plantation housed um, 41 enslaved African Americans. Locust Grove did not raise hemp, but was more of a diversified farming operation, raising corn, wheat, hogs, cattle, sheep, and fruit. Um, in the 1880s, the property was sold to the Waters family, who continued to farm the property on a smaller scale until it was purchased by Jefferson County. And in the late 1980s, the University of um, Louisville conducted extensive excavations on three slave cabins and the artifact um, assemblage was analyzed by Dr. Amy Young. And here's a picture of the cabin, one, one cabin, um, if we can flip that slide. Does that look familiar? Yes. <laughs> can you flip to the next side? <laughs> there we go from Farmington. And if you flip back, you can see they're very similar. They were, yeah. So they both had a pit cellar in front of the fireplace, and that would, would have been the equivalent of a small, like, little room fridge that you get in your hotel room. It's just a place to store things to keep them either fresher from freezing or to keep them cooler in the summer. But they're very similar. I did a bunch of research with the, um, Works Project Administration um, slave narratives um, that were recorded in the 1930s. And almost to a person, every enslaved person that they interviewed said they lived in a one room cabin with a loft above. And this is exactly what we're seeing here, a one room cabin, likely with a loft above. And we'll talk about that when we look at um, the Riverside Kitchen. Um, so, so not only did we um, use the foundation as a picture of what the houses of the enslaved would look like, but we can, would supplement that with what they said in their um, interviews during the 1930s. All right, next slide, please. This is Riverside's main house, and in the background you can see the detached kitchen. Um, Riverside was established by Ebenezer Christopher in, the 18, in 1822. Now, I really like this little story about Mr. Christopher because, you know, we always think of history as a, a, a simpler time when people got along a little better and stuff. And I'm like, no, Mr. Christopher was murdered by his son-in-law. It's kind of a Jerry Springer moment, you know, it's like, you, but we didn't have TV at that time. So there was some problem with, um, I, I suppose, Mr. Christopher's um, daughter and, and um, her husband killed her father. So kind of a cra crazy thing happened, but um, the, the people were the same as they are um, today in the past. So um, after Christopher's untimely death, um, Gabriel Farnsley acquired the property. And in about um, 1837, this house was, this main house was, was built by hand. Um, we excavated the um, brick kiln um, to where all the, all the bricks that you see, that's about 30,000 bricks in the house. And they were all made by hand. Okay. Um, after Farnsley's death, um, in 1849, um, and a very extended court case because he didn't make a will, um, and his family fought over the property. So I'm going to tell everyone right now, go ahead and make your will because everyone's going to fight over what you have. Um, Rachel and Elaine, 
Alanis and Mormon purchased the property and they eventually, um, they kept acquiring property and brought, brought their um, local land holdings to over 1,500 acres, which at the time was one of the largest um, operations in Jefferson County. Um, and at, 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 in 1860, um, Mr. Mormon owned 23 enslaved African Americans. Um, the property remained in the Mormon family until 1988 and um, when the city bought it. We have done archaeological investigations all over, and you can flip the, to the next slide. The first one was where the, the kitchen is now, and this is kind of a fun fact. Um, if you look really close, you see two people screening in the background, and that might be me playing hooky from when I was an attorney. <laughs> I would call in sick and go out and play in the dirt. Um, so what did we find from all these places. Um, the next slide. Oh, this is a bill. Um, this is a, a picture of the, the reconstructed kitchen going up. Um, and it's exactly on top of where we excavated. So that picture you just saw before, um, where things were is exactly where we put them. Where the hearth pad was is was exactly where we put the um, current chimney. Where you see the door is where we found the doorknob. Where the, bill, where the windows are is where we found the most window glass. And one of my favorite things about this building is that I always get to tell kids that as an archaeologist, I, I, I never thought, you know, archaeology had a lot of math in it, but I have to do math every single day. So if you look at the um, roof of this building, it does not have any gutters. So as the water sheets off, it drops straight down and creates a drip line. We found that drip line in the ground. It's just a line in the dirt, a little darker color. And from that, we could extrapolate the slope of the roof, knowing where the edges of the buildings were and, and things like that. So we had to use a lot of math to figure all that out. Um, but it, that's one of my favorite um, artifacts from the Riverside Kitchen is the drip line. And people are like, wow. But it tells us so much about what the building looked like and how people who lived in that building had to exist. Um, you, you could probably stand up in the middle of the, build, of the attic, but you couldn't stand up. It's not much. And it would be really hot in the summer and probably really cold in the winter. And that's where the people would have slept, unless they slept on the floor of the building um, right next to the fire. OK, we can switch. Oh, and here's some of the kids that I get to talk to all the time while we're doing archaeology. All right, we can switch. So, these are some of the artifacts that we found from Farmington. Now, there's a lot, we found mostly the same things in each place. So we find ceramics, Ecofacts, which are natural things like bones, um, leather, maybe um, shells. Mostly, in in these cases, it's mostly bone, and it's food remains. Glass, metal, stone, synthetics. Very few synthetics because there were some plastics being experimented with in the 1840s and 50s. But for each building approximately 30,000 artifacts. That's a lot of cataloging and a lot of entry into databases and um, a lot of things to go through. Um, and Locust Grove would have had three times that many because they had three um, buildings too that, that were excavated. Okay, let's switch. So the first one is ceramics. People always ask me, why do archaeologists love ceramics so much? And they are a fashion statement. So if you think back into the 19th or the 1820s, 30s, 40s, they didn't have TV, they didn't have movies, they didn't have electricity or anything like that. How would they show off their wealth? How would they drive the big fancy new car, they, they couldn't. But 
but they could get the nearest and best and the, the, the most up-to-date ceramics and have a huge dinner party or a dance, dinner party and dance, things like that. And that's what happened. In fact, at, um, when working at Ashland, at the Henry Clay Estate in Lexington, we found um, a privy filled with ceramics, perfectly good ceramics, just all of the whole thing thrown into the privy because somebody wanted new ceramics and they got rid of all the old stuff. I mean, platters that were big. So ceramics are really important. You can um, figure out how much each piece of ceramic cost, whether they were, what kind of things they were serving. Did they have um, salt spoons? Did they have shrimp bowls? Did they have all these um, etiquette things that were very important to society and whether you had wealth or not um, in the, in the um, early 19th century. Okay, we can switch. And more ceramics, because why not? You know, that's, it's one of the most important things. These here are some more mundane ceramics. They would have been used in the kitchen and used to um, cook with and store things, more so than being placed on the master's table. Okay, we can switch. And wine bottles. We found wine bottles. Now, would enslaved people have been drinking wine? Mm, oh, <laughs> excuse me. Excuse me, hold on. Let me, there we go. All right. No problem. <laughs> Maybe they would have been drinking wine. It's probably more that the wine was served at the master's table and the bottle was reused by the enslaved people to contain something else, be it water, homemade beer, um, a herbal concoction, something like that is totally possible. We would not be able to probably figure that out unless we had the remains of the what was ever, what was in the bottle, which is very difficult to have. So usually they're just filled with dirt. Okay. And here's some more glass. Um, interesting, we have medicine, a little medicine bottle on the left. Um, so there are lots of records from, I think both um, Riverside and Farmington that they were treating, the um, Crons and the Speeds were treating enslaved people with medicine. And um, th they may have given them bottles of medicine to take at certain times and things like that. The next piece with all the gold on it um, is not really gold. It's just how glass degrades as it um, sits in the ground and it's a chemical reaction. And the other two are just more pieces of glass. Do we have any comments? I see something popping up. Uh, we do. So just a couple questions um, from Linda. Ceramics provide a lot of information beyond being fashion statements. Did you find any imported objects and how do those remains help or those um, artifacts help with chronology? Oh, totally. It's all, uh, each piece of ceramic has specific dates to it. The colors have dates associated with them. Um, Almost all of them were imported, um, mostly from England. We don't have very many um, actual wares from China, um, porcelain wares, but we do have the more earthen wares um, from um, Staffordshire, England. Um, so yes, they, they tell all kinds of things ab about dates, um, how things were made, what and I, 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 I have to say, I tend to use my fashion um, example because um, a lot of people can understand that. And when you're dealing with a lot of fifth graders, that's what I tend to talk about because, you know, fifth graders are really into fashion by that point. So, so I don't mean to talk down <laughs> to anyone, um, but ceramics are in extremely important in dating and um, uh, just many other things as well. Any other uh, questions? We do. Um, 
Are you able to discern when enslaved cabins were used for families or if they were more male and female dormitories as in the case at George Washington's Mount Vernon? It would depend on the artifacts. The three that, or the three places I'm talking about here, is likely a family. And I'll show you some of the artifacts why. Um, we have, we, deciding between male and female artifacts is very difficult. Um, I think there's only a couple places that have been successful at saying that, well, this actual building, um, one of those places would be the Hermitage. They found a woman's cabin, and I don't know if they even call it that, but it's where maybe a laundry was, and they did a lot of sewing work, so they had lots of needles, um, pins, buttons in this space by this cabin. We do not find that in these three cabins. So these were likely families um, that included both men and women and children. Any other questions? Um, I do, I have a couple more. Um, would usable ceramics have been given to the enslaved for use or would they have always been dumped into privies like um, at sites like Ashland, Henry Clay? Uh, a lot of them would have been given away to, because you know, why you wouldn't spend extra money on your enslaved people by buying them ceramics. So you just give them your old stuff that you don't want anyone to see. So yes, I, I thought it was a, a kind of an anomaly that um, Mr. Clay's family threw all these things away, especially when they have big gold leaf C's all over them. I thought, well, if your last name is still Clay, but I guess whoever inherited them did not appreciate them. Um, I would say many of the ceramics found in the um, buildings that we excavated had a first life living on the master's table and then came to be into the possession of the enslaved as as they got worn out or were no longer wanted in the masters on the master's table any other ones uh, I have two more and then I'll let you move on. Um, did you find later artifacts showing that the buildings had been reused? Um, I'm not sure which site that's referring to, perhaps Riverside, um, but in your experience? Um, not at these particular sites. Most of the buildings seem to have an end date after the Civil War, so after slavery, but a approximately around 1880. Um, so if you think about something that was built in the 18 teens or so, and then having to re-roof it and stuff, by the 1880s, it's gonna be pretty um, derelict and they're gonna just take it down and, and reuse what they can. Um, such as the case at Farmington, they took out that foundation where I showed that what we call a robber's trench and they robbed the trench of, of, of the foundation. Um, we did not have too much evidence of other uses besides domestic living. Okay. Right. Um, and one final question about the reconstruction at, um, I think it's Riverside. Did you guys find evidence of more than one building on the same spot? Um, so when you reconstructed that building, did you often also find other examples of reconstruction? Um, oh, when the, they, re, re, I'm, I'm gonna have to ask a question about that. So when they reconstructed or they repaired the building or built something next to it? Um, if Brian, if you can clarify your question in the chat, that would be fantastic. Um, um, while, while you're doing that, I will say that we did find very close to the Riverside kitchen is after it had gone away, after the kitchen was gone re and reused probably in some other place or torn down, the wash house was built probably within a foot or two feet of that building. So, so in that build, the, the wash house was prob probably around 1880 to 1920 and that was an it was in existence and it was a pretty um fancy building because you a lot of places didn't have a, an actual place to do laundry but this was 
was also a soap making building so they because they had a fire available and lots of big containers so they would do both soap making and laundry in the wash house which was very close to it so yes we also had evidence of other buildings very close to it that did not date to the same time period okay i think that does answer uh the question because it's, it was he was asking if at riverside there was more than one structure on that site over time so oh. There were probably, at all these places, there were probably between 12 to 20 outbuildings at any one time. And they would have been being used and then taken down and rebuilt and changed the area of and things like that. Many of them were not permanently located anywhere um, and would be moved around as needed and as you know, a storm comes and the tree falls on the building, they just take it down and either rebuild or rebuild in a new place that works better. Right. At Locust Grove, we do have all of the outbuildings we currently have are on original foundations, but later owners of the farm, um, post-Civil War, um, they had their ice house was not where our ice house was. Their right. barn was not where our house I think the only one we kind of shared was the spring house because there's really only one place at Locust Grove to put the spring house. But all right, we do have a couple other questions, but we're going to save them for the next question answering time. So please do continue to leave your questions in the chat and take it away, Lori. Okay. Well, we can switch to the next slide. Okay, window glass. Most people think, oh, well, um, I remember actually my professor. One of my professors was like, oh, slave houses didn't have window glass. And I'm like, well, maybe not in Georgia, but in Kentucky they did. <laughs> um, and that was, that was a, a pretty um, fancy thing to have. Window glass was not, not all people had actual glass in their windows. So this was something that was um, an important thing to have to think about how they lived. Did they have um, oiled cloth? covering the windows or did they have actual glass? I'm not sure which would have been, I mean, obviously you would get more light with the window glass. You can also tell time through window glass if you can switch to the next slide. There is a formula that allows you to take the measurement of the thickness of the glass and estimate, it's not perfect, um, when it was made. Um, and the reason is this because window glass in the very, late 18th century and early 19th century was made by blowing glass. So you would have had this huge circle of glass and it would get very thin um, and then it would be cut into squares or triangles and, and whatnot. Today and, and towards the mid and later 19th century, they would float molten glass on a bed of liquid and it probably contained some heavy metals to keep it afloat the glass afloat to make it flat and it tends to be thicker. So the thicker the glass, the more recent it is. So this shows, this graph shows where, um, what Farmington's slave cabin window glass dates to. And the 1796 is really early because the Farmington wasn't even owned by the Speeds at that point, but um, Speed may have purchased glass in anticipation of, of creating a house. In, uh, he had a, a, another property um, before he purchased Farmington or the land at Farmington. So he may have purchased that in advance and then just used it at Farmington. And the last bit is probably evidence of when they took the building down and the glass broke as they took the building down. All right, let's go ahead. And nails. Nails are really important um, because they tell us about the building in which people lived. You use different size nails for different things. And they, especially with the Riverside construction, it was very important to find out how many nails um, of each size. And we, so we measure each nail, each whole nail that we can find by the penny weight. Um, so if you can go to the next slide. So this shows a breakdown of all the, the nails um, from Farmington all the way up to 30D, which is, it's like a big spike. 
and little bitty and 2Ds are very small. But each one is used for different things. Now you can probably use a five, a five penny weight to a, and a six penny weight and a seven penny weight all for the same thing. So there is some give and take there. Um, but they can tell you, do you have siding? Do you, how many times did you replace the roof? Um, is it a log building versus a frame building? Um, did it have a floor? Um, these are, this is not the only evidence of those things, but this helps us see how the building was repaired, um, how it was built to begin with, um, any kind of architectural changes, things like that with, with the nails. And can you flip to the next one? And here is a comparison of each plantation of the nails. So roofing was really important. Actually, what happened was they probably had to replace the roof every 10 years or so, um, at least, and if, if not more. Um, but it shows that the cabins were very similar at each place. Um, even though the kitchen at Riverside did not have a continuous stone foundation, they were probably very similar in construction and size and, and and the like. Next slide, please. Faunal remains. These are bones from food, mostly. Um, you can switch to the next slide. And uh, here's some more. And the next slide. These are mostly pig bones. Um, pork was incredibly important for in the slave states in general. Pork is much easier to raise than cattle. You can um, eat really little tiny baby pigs and great big old pigs. Salting and smoking pork, pork does better than beef generally. Um, and you can get up to three liters a year with a sow. And when you have lots of people to feed and you don't want to spend a lot of money on feeding them, pig is probably the best way to go. Um, I, I remember I actually argued with my husband about, we, had, we were at a trivia event and, and it was like, what's the, the most consumed meat in the world? And he said chicken. And I was like, no, 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 it's got to be pork because they're just so easy to raise. And chickens make eggs because eggs are more important. And I was right. <laughs> and it, it's based on this knowledge um, because pigs were so easy to raise. Now, I do have to say that we just watched as a family, we watched Babe. And I don't think we're gonna be eating pork for a little while in the house, so, because he was so cute. Also, when you look at the cuts of meat that were consumed by both the master and the enslaved people, they're very different. Um, the, the hams or the haunches were what, what would be served at the master's table, unlike what the um, enslaved people would have gotten. They would have gotten mostly likely feet. And we find a lot of pig's teeth, so they may have gotten the jowls as well. Although sometimes the, um, the jowls and the brain are considered very um, top of the line as delicacies. Uh, I have to tell one little story there. I was analyzing the um, bone or the faunal collection from Farmington while I was in Arizona. Um, and I was like, I have all these pig bones and I need a comparative collection so that I can identify, you know, how, how many right feet I have, how many left feet I have, those kind of things. So I went to the butcher shop and I said, I need pig feet. And they said, well, that's not a problem. And I was like, okay, I need the left front and the right front and the left rear and the right rear. And the poor butcher's face was like, she's sacrificing something. And needless to say, I did not get my pig feet. <laughs> um, it, it, that he, he was not, he was like, oh, I can't do that. So, so I never got my comparative collection, but most of the bones that we find um, in the enslaved cabins um, are lower cuts of meat. 
the refuse from the master's table, we just don't seem to find that much. Okay, next slide. Now, these are some personal items that come from the cabins. This is, these are mostly from um, Farmington and a few from Locust Grove. This is a smoking pipe. Um, so there would have been some leisure time to um, sit back and, ha and have a pipe. Would they, would they have had tobacco? They may have been able to buy tobacco or grow their own tobacco. Um, a reed would have been stuck into the stem of the pipe and it would have been exchanged. So if the reed broke, you could just put a new reed in there. Next. This is a clay marble. Um, it usually would be considered a children's toy. Um, marbles have been children's toys for eons, and although some adults would use them for gambling, so that could be a possibility as well. Next. These are actual figurines or doll parts. The one on the left, the white one, I think is kind of upside down. I didn't take a very good picture of that. It's an ear, I think. Um, and the other two are the hair of a china doll. So not only do you have like maybe little decorative um, things that people might have set around, but you may have also had dolls or small little like toys that someone could play with. Um, which is, you think about enslaved children, they, they probably, these might have been cast off from the children of the owners of the plantation. Um, they could, have purchased little decorative things that meant something to them with any money they may have actually been able to acquire. I will say that at least at Farmington, and I don't have the records for this at Locust Grove or Riverside, that these slaves, if they met their quota, they were paid overages at a very reduced rate for how much hemp they broke. So it's like two cents for a pound maybe, or a penny for per pound. And that's a lot. So, I mean, a lot of hemp for very little money. <laughs> Didn't say that very well. Okay, next, a buckle. Um, I, I don't know if this was from a shoe or a belt or maybe suspenders, but it could have been any of those things. Next. Buttons. Buttons are, are great and you can tell like when they're decorative and metal and things like that, you might get some information from them. Um, some of them would have been covered, but it shows decoration on, it can um, indicate that for clothing and what they, and, and things they would have worn, would it would all be cast off? Maybe, maybe not. Next, this is part of a fork. Um, it would have had, the, it only has one tine. So, and it would have had a, probably a bone handle that would have slid onto that um, lower right, um, in the lower right hand part of the picture, it would have slid onto there. Next, this is either a pocket knife or a razor. We don't really think about um, enslaved men carrying any kind of weapon. They regularly used guns. I, I, I think it's funny because they're, oh no, enslaved never had any arms. We find bullets all over the place. Um, who do you think was killing the hogs? I mean, they, they usually would have slit their throats. Um, but, you know, if they went out hunting, they would have had to do those kind of things. But to have a personal pocket knife or a razor, be really fascinating to see um, those sorts of things and those personal possessions give them a little more insight to how they, it's highly decorative as well, so it's really an interesting piece. We couldn't open it up um, and discover whether it was a pocket knife or a razor. So, next. This is really an interesting one. You may have seen it in the button slide. It is, it's a very small piece. It's less than a centimeter. And we think it is the top of a hat pin. So it would have held a lady's fancy hat on. 
and hat pins are pretty long. It, it was too small to be a, a plug for maybe a needle holder or anything like that. But we think it was that. It's not a super decorative hat pin, but to think that, oh, the, the enslaved people may have put their hats on to go to church, it gives a little like color to what they would have done. You know, you got dressed in your, your best and you put your hat on and your best hat pin. Next. This is a piece of slate. We, at, I think at, at Riverside and Farmington for sure, have found pencils and pieces of slate. Um, it can show maybe some secretive learning and maybe not secretive. We don't have any record of anyone saying that um, we taught so-and-so to read, but they may have been teaching enslaved people to read the Bible, things like that. Next. And beads. Beads are very important, not only for their decorative quality, but for the representation of um, the sky and freedom. So blue beads have been considered slightly an uh, indicator of enslaved contexts, although it, it's kind of a, they, they certainly are you almost always found, but then other beads are too. The blue, but the blue is very important. I don't know if you guys have ever seen a bottle tree where people hang blue bottles all over it. And it was, it's a sign of keeping the bad spirits away. Doors painted blue um, are also a sign of not letting bad spirits cross your threshold. Next. So these beads are from Locust Grove, and we have both a blue one and a clear one. Um, again, we don't know how these beads were used because this is, they were found not in, um, on a necklace or on any kind of string or anything like that. Those are gone. Remember the puzzle that we don't have all the pieces. We're only finding a little bit of it. So we have to extrapolate a little bit. All right, next. These are Spanish coins from Farmington. They're called reals. Um, they're not worth a ton of money um, for the most part. Um, and, but they're pretty exciting when you find them. Um, the one with the hole in it, I was digging by myself at Farmington one day and I was like, no way. I actually, I can't believe how I'm so deep and it was in the, like by the porch of the building. So if you remember the reconstruction of the Farmington cabin, we had that porch. It was in that kind of area, like underneath where the porch would have been over the ground. And I was like, no, really? I find a nickel this deep. I was really not happy because I was like, it's the size of a nickel. And I'm like, I'm sure it's a nickel. And so I, I'm looking at it, I'm rubbing the dirt off of it. And I'm like, 1793, that's not a nickel. I was like, ah, this is so exciting. Um, and it would have been something that you wore either around your neck um, or an ankle as a decorative piece of jewelry, but also as a talisman for good luck and to keep spirits away, things like that. Can you flip to the next slide, please? The, it also has an X on it. There's X's on both sides. Um, they're kind of hard to see in these photographs, so that's why I have the red on there. So X's become very important. You're gonna be like, you're probably like, what in the heck is this X thing about? Well, all three plantations have artifacts, different kinds of artifacts, marked with an X. Um, sometimes it's really easy to see, sometimes it's not as easy to see, but for all three plantations to have contexts where enslaved people lived and have artifacts with X's on them, I think is, is very interesting. So researching into these X's, well, first let's go through the, the artifacts with X's on them and then I'll explain what the research says. So next. Oh, well, here we go, cosmograms. West African religions 
in general use a cosmogram to explain their ideas of the um, origin of the universe and how the universe works. So, of course, if you turn this cosmogram slightly on its side, it's an X, right? But right, it's crossed lines. So it is, it's kind of a, re it's a religious symbol. It, the circle illustrates the continuity of the universe, the a life cycle, birth, death, rebirth, um, a spi uh, the spiritual journey of human life and the evolution of the soul. Um, the crossed arms rep represent the four cardinal directions. Um, the realm of the living is to the top and the realm of the dead is to the bottom and that middle line is a kind of no man's land of water. Um, a water barrier. It can also be the top is the sun, the bottom is the moon, the top is the male, female. So archaeologists um, in the mid-70s and early 80s found X's on pots in South Carolina. They were handmade pots by enslaved people and they were found in kind of strange contexts like in creeks, upside down, smashed, but they all had these X's on the bottom. Um, and Leland Ferguson was the archeologist who, who looked at it. And he at first attributed some of the construction of the pots to Native Americans and, and then decided that wasn't quite right and that they were made by enslaved people. But they were using this X. So he was like, what does this X mean? You know, does it mean the potter who actually made them? Does it mean the owner of the pot? Because um, they were they were in the clay before they were fired, so it had to mean something. And of course, in in South Carolina, you have very early um, influx of people being brought through the slave trade. So you have people direct coming directly from Africa. So he studied African religions and found that this uh, is an example of how they use these some marks. And that the the kind of crossed lines had become a simple way of representing um, a spiritual belief or a cultural identifier is what i'm gonna say so these x's that were placed up uh, the pots with the x's on them were placed upside down um, in creeks he found that the same thing happened in africa when someone died so it was a way of taking someone's pot and smashing it and letting their spirit go into the, into the water realm so that they could get to the spirit world. Um, so it's kind of interesting that you have these in South Carolina and now I'm seeing these X's on all these artifacts. So let's look at the X's on our artifacts and so we can flip the next. So this is the Riverside Spoon and I, I know you're like, I don't see an X, it's there. Click one more time. There you go. It, it, you can really see it if you're close up. It is hard to see taking a picture of it. So, so the Riverside Spoon has an X on it. Now, again, does this mean it's a cosmogram or is it I own this? It's still an interpretation. Okay, next slide. This is a coin from Locust Grove, and you can see um, that it has these little notches that were specifically put in there. They were not there originally, and you could have wrapped it or like some string around it and created an X, um, a symbol, um, and strung it up and kept it in your pocket or created a um, necklace or something like that. Next slide. This is a marble incised with an X. Next, a spoon from Locust Grove. Now that X is, it looks really bright here. Um, I found out that they put a little tiny bit of um, baby powder on there so you could see that. So that's why it's so bright. Um, so it, it works for the photograph so that you can actually see it. Um, don't know if there's any more. And another coin with an X from Locust Grove. So this is a picture 
of what is called the Conjurer's Cabin at the Levi Jordan Plantation in Texas. Um, the Levi Jordan Plantation was established before the Civil War um, and kept importing enslaved people through an illegal slave trade through Mexico. So they had someone who came directly from um, directly from Africa through, by way of Mexico, illegally, um, towards the civil, end of the Civil War or before the Civil War when the slave trade was illegal. He was a medicine man and was given a cabin and lived on the Levi Jordan Plantation after the Civil War. Um, and in about the 1880s, the owners, something happened, and I'm not exactly sure how this went, went down, but they had, everyone on the plantation had kind of stayed where they were, not being able to go anywhere else or find jobs after the Civil War, um, and being convinced probably to stay there and work the plantation. That's a whole nother story in and of itself. But at one point, the plantation was sold and everyone had to leave within like three hours. So everyone on the plantation just took what they could pack up and left. Um, so nothing was really destroyed and, and many things were just left in place like beds in the cabins and stuff, stuff they couldn't carry. And this cabin was excavated and in the floor, these, there were four groups of artifacts found that formed an X in the cardinal directions. Now you can see with the cabin itself is not in the cardinal directions. So they actually had to specifically put them in certain spots to create the cardinal directions. And each of them represented like the sun or the moon, water going across. And um, it's a pretty amazing thing. And one of the archeologists who worked on this still works in Texas and excavates other African-American um, places, abodes, you know, like cabins and stuff. And he was actually, the last time I talked to him, he was working on a church and he was digging because none of us knew any of this until this, this cabin was excavated. Like we could find X's in the ground, you know, and these were like, there was no lines, but the things were in the cardinal direction. He digs in foot by foot squares and water screens every bit of dirt so that he can find the tiniest artifact and how it was. And I actually think that there is a chance and I'd really like to get into the artifacts from Locust Grove um, to see if I can figure out where they were placed. Um, when they were excavated, it was a really dry summer and they didn't have any good stratigraphy. So the layers of the earth were not very visible when they were digging, so they did arbitrary levels. Um, and it was super dry, so the, the, the dirt was, you couldn't tell the differences in, in, in layers. And I don't think they piece plotted or found the exact location with the GPS or anything like that of each artifact, but I would really love to examine those because of the next artifacts. Can you switch the slide? These are some crystals that were found at Locust Grove, probably from a chandelier or something, but they were found in the slave cabin. So this could be a reflective thing, meaning water, maybe. I don't have the location, and these were not something that were, the location of it wasn't recorded in, in Dr. Young's thing because the Levi Jordan plantation didn't happen until after she had done her work at Locust Grove. The next slide, please. And these are Chinese coins, which could also be a part of um, a, you know, an X symbolizing something. Um, we have, one was probably worn because it has a hole in it. It could have been many things. Those, those are some of the artifacts that I'd really like to try to figure out where they were located in each building. Next slide. I've got to hurry up. <laughs> this was found, these are artifacts 
um, found from a plantation in Jessamine County. And so I wanted to show this slide because some of the artifacts that we just saw could be something like this. And I don't have all the, like, if, if not at Farmington or Riverside, but maybe Locust Grove. So um, this was, these artifacts were found, if you look at the lower thing where you have the black on top of the, um, the, the ceramic, that is trying to show you the upside down. So it was put upside down over all these artifacts. And it could not have just happened like that. Um, the archaeologists who dug in Jessamine County believe this could be an ancestor shrine that you would have when someone um, died, your, their spirit became part of your religious lexicon. Um, you, they were the go-between between, between God and you, and you could talk to them, and, and, and you would make, not offerings, but respectful um, acknowledgments of their power in both this world and the next. So um, I just wonder if some of the artifacts that we don't have the location, for, you know, the exact location and how they were laid out at Locust Grove, if we could have anything like this. I think it's a, it would be a fun thing to apply for a grant or something like that to, to work on that, to see if we could dig some more. And in, in the previous record, we've already obviously dug at Locust Grove already in these, these contexts. We can't redo it, but we could take all the notes and go through it and see what we could find. All right, final slide. These are enslaved people from the plantations. Um, the top um, left-hand corner are David and Martha Spencer from Farmington. Um, Mr. Bishop, Stephen Bishop, I'm sure. He was not actually at Locust Grove, he was at Mammoth Cave, but I didn't have a picture and I really wanted a picture for Locust Grove, so. But he was owned by Dr. John Craw. I think it's... Craw, yes, he was. Yes, he was, he was owned by John, when um, Dr. Craw bought Mammoth Cave. So it, he, he may have visited at some point, we don't know. Um, or maybe they can tell, or maybe we do. He did visit Locust Grove at least yeah. once in the year um, 1842 to 1843 because his famous map of Mammoth Cave that appears in Rambles of Mammoth Cave was likely drawn at Locust Grove. Um, and we also are trying to figure out if his wife, Charlotte, um, he married um, a woman named Charlotte. So her name was Charlotte Brown. Um, he was Stephen Bishop, so it was Charlotte Brown Bishop, and then she later married another cave guide, um, um, Matt or, uh, one of the Bransfords, I can't remember if it was Matt Bransford and Nicholas Bransford after Stephen Bishop's death. We're trying to figure out if Charlotte's primary home was Mammoth Cave or if she and um, Stephen Bishop met at Locust Grove. Um, but awesome. uh, we have, we, we have a, we're, Stephen Bishop is one of our, uh, we have more information on Stephen Bishop than almost any other enslaved person at Locust Grove or related to Which, which is why I could find a picture of him. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. And the, um, uh, with the, with the horse and carriage, this is um, Richard and Kitty Thomas, who stayed at Riverside after the Civil War and continued to work with the family. And um, I think Richard actually even served in the um, Negro troops and Kitty got his Civil War pension, widower's pension and things like that. They've done a lot of fabulous research on both um, Richard and Kitty. So these are the people we are trying to elucidate just a little bit about their lives that we would never hear about without the archeology. span um, We couldn't picture where they lived or how they lived or what they ate, how they dressed, things like that. Um, with without having the archaeology artifacts to, to look at. Now, that's it for me, but I will happily answer any questions, or please, if I um, said anything wrong about Locust Grove. <laughs> no, no, you did, you did great. Um, so we do have a couple questions. Um, okay. You mentioned, Lynn, Lynn Ann would like to know, you mentioned plantations from other counties. Have you ever worked on any part county locations? 
Hart County. No, not plantations. I don't think I've actually worked in Hart. I've worked in many of the counties, but that doesn't, it, no, I don't think so. I, actually, I, even though I'm a, oh, this is Javier. <laughs> 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 Welcome, um, Javier. We're pleased you're with us. <laughs> I think he's coming to make sure. He's actually considered my, um, he doesn't like my computer sitting up because he likes to lay against the back of the computer and keep it warm and safe. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but I work in, in many counties, um, but I, don't, I, do, I do not believe I've done any work in heart. I do some Native American archaeology. Um, so some of those, some of the counties go over, but I have not worked on a plantation in Hart County. Um, we have a question from Locust Grove's gardener, Sarah. How well does leather survive? I found a child-sized shoe sole a few years ago and wondered if it was even possible for it to be a Cron era relic, so the early 19th century. Probably not. Ugh. Disappointed. Yeah. <laughs> It's probably like early 20th century, but you know, I have seen stuff in privies. Okay. Like I got a lot of shoes out of privies from downtown Louisville, and, which was amazing, but let's just say they were kind of sealed. So they would have had all the privy stuff and then they would have been sealed with dirt. And that may have created some kind of interesting <laughs> chemical reaction that would allow it to to stay there as now they don't last sometimes when you dig them up they start to disintegrate so but I doubt in just a regular um, garden space where Sarah would generally find stuff I would I would say it's probably early 20th century second second only to the archaeologists who've worked at Locust Grove Sarah finds more things in the ground because her I, because of her job so she exactly. often finds a lot of uh, really cool artifacts Yes. Um, Charlie Casper would like to know how many slave buildings were there, uh, for instance, at Farmington? How many persons typically per cabin? Um, we would, um, you know, it depends. So my estimate at Farmington is there's four cabins enumerated in, in 1860 in the, in the census. They had more slaves than the could fit in the um, in those four buildings. So some of them may have been away from the main house. Um, Riverside had at least two or three, and they were also some of them were away from the main house. And with forty one enslaved people. They would need more than three cabins, and that's what's been identified for Locust Grove. Um, so there are probably some more that we just don't know about. Um, they may have been for the single men, and they were less. They lived in the barn, um, things like that. Those are still parts of the puzzle that we haven't been able to answer yet. Um, and that's something something we're doing at Locust Grove currently as well, is we do have um, foundations of uh, slave cabins, both um, in our, what is now our meadow and also back in our woods, but we're turning our wood shop into an enslaved family dwelling. And so figuring out what sort, how are we defining family? Who is going to live here? What, um, but uh, it's, it's such an interesting project to think about. And I didn't answer that question, like how many people would live in a one room building. It could be anywhere from a nuclear family, which right. could have been, and to an extended family. So I would say anywhere between like five and 10 people. <laughs> yeah, I, I think, and I think that's what we're finding at Locust Grove as well. And we don't know if at Locust Grove people lived, this is something we're looking into, if people lived in their family units. Um, or if we had single men in dormitories and single women in dormitories until they established family units, it's something that it's something we're still looking for the evidence on. Right. Um, and speaking of enslaved cabins, um, Sharon, who's one of Locust Grove's volunteers, lives on a piece of property that used to be the homestead of Walker Taylor, Zachary Taylor's nephew. Okay. She knows where the original house once stood, um, but the area around it is mostly a developed neighborhood. Is there any way to determine where the enslaved cabins might have once stood within this development? Um, 
first I would start with the documents and look at anything you can find because maps and descriptions of the property might be in all kinds of things. They could be in tax records, um, letters, um, and then also I would look at when the subdivision was platted because there might be some maps that way to kind of figure out where they, you know, like from an original map um, or something like that. And to just like, if, if you just plunk me down at the house, I'd be like, uh, behind it <laughs> would be the most likely place. But um, if it's, if it's highly developed and I, I know that neighborhood is, a lot of it's going to be lost because if they used a bulldozer to do it, it's, I mean, you might still find some remnants, but it, the, the context. So like where, that's why the, the thing at Levi Jordan was so fabulous because no one had touched it. It, it was amazing and, and no one had lived there since then and it was all still there. Like if somebody had lived in that cabin for a while afterwards, they would have dug up the floor and put a floor in and carpeted it and put siding on stuff. That's what happened to one of those slave cabins at Riverside. There was another cabin, not the kitchen, but another cabin. And it was, it had electricity and running water and siding and, you know, it didn't look like a slave cabin, but it, it had been. So the, all those things would change what was going on. I'm not sure I answered the question, but. No, I think, I think that that's, that's true of Locust Grove as well. So we currently have 55 acres of what was a 693.5 acre site. And we are surrounded by the Indian Hills development, the Poplar Hills development, uh, Riverwood and Clarkwood. And so we believe that our mill is somewhere in someone's backyard in Riverwood um, by looking at the documentation. So that's something that's something that we are, um, that we all contend with when you're, like you said, when bulldozers come in, we don't have um, archeology span or even just the, the idea that Locust Grove was 693.5 acres, but in the middle of the 19th century, those acreages started to be sold off and different people bought different parts of the land. And so at the same time that we're interested in, we don't have access to that land. So um, that's something that is just really interesting. Um, so a couple, one final question. Um, what, if you can tell us, is the Kentucky Archaeological Survey or just you yourself, what are you currently working on? What's something, what are some things that you are, uh, what are some projects that we can pay attention to? I am getting ready as, as soon as I finish cataloging, um, probably like 20,000 artifacts. Sure. <laughs> I'm going to, my next project is going to be writing a, Kind of a coffee table book for Fort Campbell. Okay. So I'm going to be writing jointly with some of my other colleagues. We will be doing some history of specific neighborhoods that were uh, in towns and, and how the history went um, on Fort Campbell's property and making sure that people who come to Fort Campbell have good information for um, locating relatives that they might have had that used to live on the property and um, the important towns and buildings that are now gone because it's now a military fort because there were you know full towns that were on the, the fort itself and are now just completely gone. That's my next project. That sounds yeah, and That's I get to go to the Daniel Boone National Forest and look for a rock shelter, Native American rock shelters in November. <laughs> oh, wow. Well, that's exciting. Um, I, I get to actually go dig. I, I will be socially distant. No one will be around us in, in, in the Daniel Boone, and we'll be hiking, and there's, like, no cell service, and it's all, it's going to be cold and, you know. Fabulous. So how many people can join you on that? Because that sounds like an ideal antidote to our current pandemic situation is being in the woods with no cell service. <laughs> I am looking forward to being out in the woods for a little while. That is wonderful. Um, well, and at Locust Grove, we just, so everyone knows, uh, Lori, we are happy to answer any questions you have at Locust Grove. Um, we'll get you the information you need, um, but our archaeological yeah, let's talk about the artifacts and 
I think it would be so awesome to take the artifacts that we already have and, and try to figure out if we can reconstruct some of that where they were and what do we have any of those ancestor shrines, exes, and it, even if not, it will still have more information about the context of where they were and how they may have been used. So I think it would be a, a, a fun project to do. We, we agree. Our archaeological connection, for those who may not know and who may be interested, is actually housed at the University of Louisville's Archaeology Center. Um, and we've been working with them on a grant to digitize um, that collection um, to some degree. And we're also working with that co collection um, and we'll be working with Lori, um, to, it sounds like, um, and some other folks to figure out um, uh, how to best furnish and represent our new enslaved dwelling. Um, in case you don't know, or I'll just remind you because we're very excited about this opportunity, we um, have a wood shop on site that is being transformed into a single enslaved dwelling. So it's going to be a space for us to represent the lives of the enslaved. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, we don't know if we're going to represent a single family in that space um, or if we are going to represent um, an extended family or just young men. We, we're not sure yet, but we'll be able to recognize the lives of the enslaved, their contributions to Locust Grove, their lives at Locust Grove. Um, as our director likes to say, um, we're going to be able to figure out what they, we hope to be able to figure out what they dreamed about at night. And you're even to just acknowledge the fact that they had dreams at night for their lives. Um, beyond Locust Grove. Um, so we'll be, we're still, we've been, that's actually been a project that has not been impacted by the pandemic. And I think our intern, Kate Lamb, was on here earlier. So we'll be talking later on. Uh, but that's something to stay tuned with us about uh, for the next, um, for the next few months, because we hope that that will be completed sometime in the spring of 2021. Um, hopefully pandemic notwithstanding hopefully capital campaign construction notwithstanding. Um, but our next, uh, Lori, thank you so much for being with us today. It was wonderful to have you. Um, and everyone, our next lecture will be on October 21st. It will be about the genealogy, or genealogy finding records of ancestors um, and finding how, how we know what we know about the lives of the enslaved in um, records, not artifacts like um, Lori was talking about. So that will come be coming up on October 21st, be watching your email for that uh, information. And we're so grateful to all of you for joining us today. So and, and we will, oh, there's another kitty. I there's know. so many kitties. Marsha has a kitty, Javier has a kitty. Um, my dog just left the room because there's, he's outnumbered by cats. So, <laughs> so we will, um, we hope to be able to see all of you very, very soon. Um, and uh, thank you so much for joining us and have a great afternoon. Bye everyone. Bye, please feel free to email me or anything like that. We will, we'll send your contact information in our follow-up email. Stay tuned everyone. Bye. Bye-bye.